my name is Martin Ekenbach. I'm heading the H&M Group Circular Innovation Lab. And today I'm going to speak a little bit about what we do to support startups and innovators to scale up more sustainable materials in a faster way. Uh, and also relevant sustainable materials for us to use in the future. H&M uh, Group is a family of brands. H&M uh, is, of course, the largest ones, but we also have Cost Weekday, Monkey, H&M Home, Stories, Arcade, Found, and then we have some business ventures as well. Uh, I've collected a few of the goals. We have quite, quite a lot of goals uh, in the H&M Group, but I've collected a few of them that I thought was most relevant for this topic. Uh, and the first one is that we, 2025, will use 30% recycled materials in our products. Uh, 2021, we reached 17.8%, uh, but we are still struggling with uh, increasing that. Uh, and I'm positive that we will reach 30% until 2025. All polyester used in our products will, by 2025, be 100% recycled. Uh, all wood used in our products and packaging will be made from FSC certified materials or fibers from alternative sources such as agricultural residues or post-consumer textiles. Uh, and that's also something we're working very hard to increase the textile to textile recycling. Uh, we will only source from producers of viscose and MMC fibers that have good environmental practices such as closed loop process processing of water and chemicals. And this is also very important for us. Uh, by the end of 2030, we will only use 100% recycled or other more sustainably sourced materials in our uh, supply chain. Uh, and to live up to this, uh, we started in 2019 the Circular Innovation Lab to try to speed up the development uh, in the industry and try to help all the innovators and uh, startups out there. Uh, because we saw that the materials that we need in order to reach these results aren't available uh, in large scales, uh, in large volumes and in the specific demands that we have. So we need to support the innovation community to, to scale up. Uh, and the first thing we did was that we tried to map out how do we work with, uh, with uh, innovators and startups uh, within the H&M group. So in these pictures, you can see Circle Innovation Lab, which is my team, working with uh, scouting, uh, testing, evaluating new and interesting processes and materials in our supply chain. And we're doing that in close collaboration with our brands, of course, because the brands are the ones that are demanding uh, new sustainable uh, materials. They're demanding a certain uh, quality, a certain hand feel, uh, a certain yeah, touch and feel of the materials, so to say. And through the brands, we're also working together with our supply chain. So that's the channel out to our supply chain, because we don't own our production. Uh, but we have very close cooperation with our supply chain. So that's the one we're using to evaluate these processes and materials in real life. And that's very valuable when you are a small company uh, with small volumes uh, at very high prices to be able to have our supply chain open up to evaluate the materials. Uh, we also have the H&M CoLab, which is a vital part in this innovation ecosystem. They're doing equity investments in startups. Uh, and what we are doing is that some of our projects might be part of the technical due diligence for them to then make an investment. But we're also able to work with the, uh, the companies within this portfolio to help them to develop their materials, to steer them in the right direction, to have the connection to our brands, and also to have the connection to our supply chain. Because equity uh, money is one thing, and our project uh, funding is a totally different thing uh, to develop. Then another part, which is the H&M Foundation. And H&M Foundation is a total financial separated uh, uh, entity from the H&M Group. So uh, we don't have that kind of connection. Uh, so if another brand reaches out to H&M Foundation, they have to give them the same information as they give to us. Uh, but they have something that we are uh, using quite a lot, the Global Change Award. 
all uh, this is a uh, con uh, competition where you can apply for one year uh, incubation uh, with a vast network of industry players and also some funding for your projects to develop. Uh, and we are of course talking to all the winners and many of the applicants uh, that are um, uh, applying for this Global Change Award. And while they are also uh, attending to that, we are able to start up projects to develop their materials and their processes. So wherever you are in your process, we are able to keep the contact with the different players in this area. Uh, which means when they're ready, we are able to support them in the best possible way. Whether it's equity investments, whether it's a project, uh, <coughs> sorry, whether it's a project where, where we develop or uh, help them to evaluate their their products, uh, or if it's time for a small collection to put it on the market to put it on a real trial. So in our projects. The thing we do is basically to take it from lab scale into bulk scale. That's our aim. And we realize that when you work in petri dish volume uh, in a lab uh, with uh, professors and PhD students, the cost is quite high uh, for these materials. Uh, and we're fine with that. Uh, we, can, we, we can handle that kind of cost. But we need to see in the long run that the cost is coming down and reaching relevant price points. Uh, and uh, in this case, we're looking at, it, uh, at uh, what kind of feedstock are you using? Are you using uh, uh, conventional production equipment? Uh, is the feedstock available at a global level and so on? Uh, another thing is that almost anything can be produced in a lab, uh, which means that yeah, everything is possible. It's a totally different ballgame to move that into industrial production. Uh, and this is also something we're trying to help these companies uh, to do. To have industrial partners or our supply chain to help them, uh, or find ways to scale up into industrial scale. Because a lot of hurdles will uh, be present on that, on that journey. Uh, another thing we look at is that in the beginning, uh, most of these companies are uh, positioned at in, in larger cities in Europe, North America, uh, or uh, Asia. Uh, but for us to have them uh, as a relevant supplier of raw materials and uh, our feedstock, uh, we need to have them at global scale and global availability. Is it possible to set up this production on a global scale? And of course, in the beginning, we can produce small patches of, of fabric. Uh, we work with everything from a couple of grams of fibers up to two, three hundred kilos of fibers so that we can make a small collection. Uh, but the most important part for us is that we can evaluate something that we call hand feel. And this is uh, very uh, very unspecific, uh, unscientific value. Uh, which is used on a daily basis within the H&M group. Uh, it's when we come with the material. And you can... I, I would love to say that the degree of polymerization is the best measurement, uh, whether it's a good fiber or not. But we can't say that. We need to create uh, yarn, we need to create a fabric that is matching, uh, and we need to put that on the table to show it to our designers and product developers. They will then pick it up, use their fingers and evaluate the hand feel, which is very difficult to specify in an early stage. Uh, so, but that's, that's reality, and that's something we need to take into consideration uh, when we start developing these fibers as well. Uh, another thing we realized starting up, uh, we, we saw the um, innovation evolution, uh, and Basically, we have quite a lot of companies uh, down in lab scale. Companies, research institutes, universities. Uh, there are a lot of good ideas out there. And we are quite, and have been historically quite good at monitoring these. Uh, we have our brands constantly monitoring the, the, the uh, innovations coming out. Uh, we have CoLab uh, investing in these companies. Uh, we have ourselves. 
uh, and we we have quite good uh, a quite good view of what kind of innovations are out there. Uh, in the other part of the scale, the bulk scale, we are quite good as well. We have a mature um, organization to take care of large volume uh, and to procure that. Uh, and in this part, I mean, you need all the certificates, you need all the global availability, you need the price points and everything else. What we haven't been that good at is supporting these companies in between lab scale until they reach bulk scale. And this is what we're trying to do now. We try to support them while they have very low volumes of uh, pricey materials, uh, until they are more ready to increase the volumes, still at high prices. But if we can support them during their journey, I think they are able to scale up much faster. And this is also where you build your pilot factory to prove to the industry that this is working. Uh, this is a process that we could scale. Uh, and also, this is a product that has a demand on the market. And that's also what we can help and support the innovators with, to have that connection to the end customer. Uh, and this might take 10 to 15 years uh, to reach from lab scale into industrial scale. Uh, and that's a very long time. Uh, and our goals are 2030, we have also 2040 goals, but we need to start now. Uh, in order for us to achieve our goals. Uh, and hopefully we can decrease uh, this amount of time, but it's quite difficult to build up uh, a new industry uh, around a new fiber. So uh, we need all the support we can have and the innovators need all the support we can give them. Uh, also the demand, what kind of demand do we have as H&M Group? This is our uh, 2021 H&M uh, Group material basket. And as you can see, the main portion of that is cotton. So about 62% that we use is cotton. 20% is polyester. Uh, then we have 5.6% wood and MMCF. Uh, and then we have a, a couple of other materials like leather, wool, uh, nylon, and so on. So what are we doing in these different areas? For cotton, for example, which is the most important material for us, we are working quite a lot with uh, organic cotton. We are also supporting in-conversion cotton, uh, which means that farmers that want to uh, uh, remake their production of cotton from conventional cotton into organic cotton, it takes like four years about. Uh, during that time, we support them by buying from those farms in order for them to do that transition, because they will lose money, they will lose um, yield in their production and so on. So that's a way to support them into taking the right decisions. We also have Better Cotton Initiative, uh, which is an organization that is monitoring and helping farmers to grow cotton in a more res responsible way. Uh, we also try to re use more recycled content in the cotton. That's what we're doing uh, right now. What we're doing on the innovation side, we're looking into, are we able to produce cotton in a different way? Do we need the plant or, or could we produce it in a lab? Uh, and of course, the lab is just the first phase. We need to move that into industrial as well. But it is actually possible to produce cotton in a lab, in a petri dish as well. Uh, then we are supporting future farming solutions. Uh, we're looking into different uh, ways of farming in India, for example. Uh, looking into the hydroponic solutions, where you distribute water and nutrients in the exact amount that is needed to grow the plant, uh, instead of watering the whole field. Uh, and we're also using tents to uh, reduce the use of pesticides, for example. So that's also a way to look into new solutions where we can, uh, where we can uh, use um, innovations. Of course, one of the biggest problems uh, with cotton is the recycling. Today we have mechanical recycling, which is uh, a good way to recycle cotton, but it's not a good way to keep the quality of the cotton because the fiber length will decrease by each cycle. Uh, that's a real challenge for us to decrease the degradation of the cotton during this process. Uh, 
And then we have another interesting part, and that's the alternative materials. Because, to be honest, we are not looking for viscose. Uh, we're looking for cotton. And if you can't have cotton, we're looking for cotton-like materials that could be derived from uh, other wood-based, for example, uh, feedstocks. But we need to have something that is more cotton-like than viscose, because our customers doesn't demand uh, an increase uh, in this 5.6 percent. They they're looking for more cotton or cotton-like materials, and that's the important part for us as well. When it comes to polyester, uh, we are increasing the recycled content, and of course, we're trying to move away. Today, most recycled polyester is from PET bottles. Uh, this is not a favorable solution long term, because we don't want to take something from a perfect system where you have PET bottles going in circles, uh, being recycled in the same way. Uh, making garments out of that, where we don't really have the recycling scheme to get it into the system again. So we're trying to increase the use of textile to textile recycling polyester uh, instead of PET bottles. Uh, we're also supporting innovations in this kind. Uh, textile to textile recycling, we have quite a lot of different projects uh, and we're trying to set up the projects according to the full chain. So we're looking into how do we collect, how do we sort these textiles, because they need to be sorted uh, and hopefully not manually, but automated, uh, so that we're able to get uh, vast volumes of these recycled textiles into our recycling processes. And there are quite a lot of steps on the way before we can hand it over to a recycler saying that here is a polyester rich content textile post-consumer waste that you can use because it needs shredding, you need to remove trims, you need to remove metals and other contaminations and then you have the yield. I mean the most, the most uh, uh, used material today is, is polycotton. It's a blend of polyester and cotton. And how do we separate those two without destroying uh, either one of them? And today we're able to uh, remove the polyester, but then we practically destroy the cotton. Uh, so we're trying to find solutions for this and to, to try the full cycle uh, of our materials as well. Uh, alternatives feedstocks, uh, we're looking into bio-based, but also biodegradable feedstocks for, for polyester alternatives. Uh, and of course, I mean, there's a huge problem with microfibers shedding from, from textiles when washing them. Uh, if we could use uh, biodegradable materials, it would be great, of course. Uh, we also need to look into what is biodegradable? Uh, is it industrial biodegradability or will it degrade in seawater? Uh, will it degrade once uh, we have used uh, different dye stuff and chemical treatments on it? Uh, how does that affect the biodegradability? So it's not an easy task, I would say. You can say that the fiber is biodegradable. It doesn't mean that the garment is biodegradable. So that's also something we're looking into quite a lot. Uh, we have quite a lot of projects going into textile to textile viscose. How do we take care of the viscose uh, once we have put it on the market? There are quite a lot of viscose out there. Uh, we are creating quite a lot of new uh, man made cellulosic fibers. How do we take care and recycle those fibers once they are coming back? Uh, because we will never say that something is compostable to our customers, because we don't want to. Uh, give them the opportunity to throw away the garments. We, want, we, we don't want to see it as waste. We want to see it as a resource that we can put in to the circular system again, so we can use it again and again. Uh, we're also looking into other sus more sustainable processes within uh, the MMCF uh, process, of course. Uh, we have other materials such as um, leather, for example. We have a lot of mycelium-based uh, leathers that we're evaluating. We're looking into fermentation quite a lot. Uh, how do we ferment the feedstock to be used for future fiber production? 
protein-based fibers, what are we able to do with those? Uh, can we make something like wool or could we do something else with these protein-based uh, fibers? Uh, also the sorting for recycling, uh, we're looking into different projects on how to automatically sort uh, these fibers or these garments coming into our systems. Uh, and also using enzymes to break down different blends of materials. So, my last slide is basically our material innovation needs. Uh, and we have several. Uh, I have put this together for, for this occasion, since it's uh, quite cellulosic based today. Uh, we will always promote that we need more cotton, uh, or alternatives to cotton. So, alternative ways to produce cotton. Uh, recycling of cotton without quality loss. Are we able to do something about these fibers to prolong them? Or are we even able to increase the quality when recycling them? Uh, methods of separating co cotton and polyester, as I've been mentioning as well. Uh, then the arrows are quite wrong here, I think. Uh, the arrow from the viscose shirt should be going to the sugar for fer fermentation part. So what are we able to do with the viscose coming out uh, on the market? Uh, are we able to do MMCF with cotton qualities out of it? Uh, are we able to detect these new materials in automated sorting, like near-infrared spectroscopy, for example? Uh, could we use uh, feedstock from, from forests to, to create polyester-based fibers, or polyester-like fibers? Uh, feedstock for elastic fibers, are we able to in, uh, remove the elastane from the market by adding something from the forest instead? Uh, Cellulosic-based surface treatments, we're always looking after surface treatments uh, that are relevant. Cellulosic-based alternatives to plastic, of course, packaging and, and um, yeah, all the accessories that we use. We have quite a lot of different product types in our assortment. So I wanted to leave you with this picture uh, and uh, I'm quite humbled to stand in front of this crowd of knowledge. It's uh, a lot of people with great knowledge in this room. And I hope the solutions are out there. Uh, we are ready to support them uh, if you contact us and if you have a relevant product that we can help you to evaluate or to discuss or if you need any input on what kind of future needs we see on the market and so on. Uh, and I think we'll have questions afterwards as well. So thank you very much for listening.